von den Now, from these allegedly always young, naked Mulrads to the old people who need care. Uh, now, Silke van Dijk will talk about the next topic. She is director of the Institute for Political Sociology at the Schiller University in Jena. She deals with, in a broader sense, and in general with identity policies of different kinds, with uh, social policy and the welfare state, and especially with the sociology of age and aging and the demography. Her presentation is quite provocative with its title, What do the elderly owe us? And the longer you dwell on this question, which we hardly ask, the more you start to think about it and to contemplate about age, aging, and also the concept of owing and debt. So enjoy Professor Silke van Dijk's presentation. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for this very friendly introduction and also the invitation. I find it extremely interesting to be in this interdisciplinary context and hopefully to have discussions in the break and tonight. Now we're actually taking a leap from biology to sociology, the social and societal frameworks of aging. And now my question in the title is, what do the elderly owe us? Then I ask this not myself, but rather it is a quote of a societal um, attitude, which we should actually take a closer look at. In many Western industrialized countries, the elderly have perceived a certain special role. They are sent into the well-deserved retirement. And at the end of the 1950s, beginning of the 60s, when they are 50 years old or uh, almost 60 years old, and then they they are at the fringes of society, really. They are taking up a special role and they need to be cared for. Or they become care cases. But for a quite some time now, this is not the case anymore. I think the age can be looked at from two different perspectives now. So on the one hand, it's a crisis scenario of the dem demographic change, so it's social aging. But on the other hand, the, the um, reinvention of the elderly, they become more active. Now, and at the end of my presentation, I would like to talk about the current situation, the pandemic situation, and ask what has changed under these conditions when dealing with age and aging. The list of crises when it comes to the aging society is long. You know, there are old people, a grey republic, um, old burdens, retirements, and these are crisis words in order to describe the situation of an aging society and there are lots of these words and usually they are quite apocalyptic if you will and uh, it's almost close to climate change and all these discussions about climate change but in parallel you could experience another development namely the search for potentials in old age and this nicely links to what Andreas Kruse has talked about. So it's not the potential of the individuals, but in how far the old people can be a resource for younger generations. Because when you look for an exit from this demographic crisis scenario, the old people themselves were the cause of, and they were actually the, the um, solution to the problems. So, in average, they are younger, they are healthier, they are more educated, and thus they, according to politicians, they could actually give back to the society. 
by, for example, even if they are retired, they can still be participants of society. You know, they, they, they can take care of the grandchildren instead of sending them to daycare and be useful to the society. So the idea is not that retirement is a reward for what you did in your career, but the question now is what could these retired people in the welfare state give back to society? Now, this is an exam example of a campaign of the ministry. It says, count your deeds, not your wrinkles. And also, this is from the same ministry. You can leave a better mark than just a dent on the sofa. And here you can see that the elderly are asked to not just sit down and relax and watch TV, but actually do something. Old people today are fitter, they are more active, and they can be a resource against the demographic change. Of course, this is a provocation to a development that I will comment on later on. For at least two decades now, we have been dealing with the societal rethinking of old age. And at first sight, it might be quite surprising. You know, we heard about the biological processes of aging, but here you can now see that not just the aging process, but also what we understand by old age is a highly social question. And if we ask this question, it depends on the perspective, the individual perspective. Children, they think, children think that everybody above 40 years old is old and then uh, sometimes it's just 50 plus or 60 plus is an old age. It's very individual but f learning from many s interviews with people older than 60, they regard people older than 80 or people who are health not as healthy, they are considered old. And if you take a look at the Brockhaus Dictionary from 1896, then the old age was between 40 and 50 for women and for men between 50 and 60. So that was a huge difference, even though women have a longer or a higher lifespan than men as you can see from uh, and uh, you know that this has changed now learning from different surveys now the social institutionalization is very much seen in the industrialized uh, countries especially when they enter retirement and you can see that then um, People are considered old once they are retired in these industrialized countries. So you can see this is a social marker and not a natural marker. But what are we talking about when it comes to the productive or active age under the headline, what do the elderly owe us? It's about stopping your career after the uh, age of 60. It's about civic engagement. It's about engagement in churches, in uh, associations, in neighborhood clubs, and also care f in their families. Now, that's what they do. You know, uh, for example, when the grandparents take care of the grandchildren, uh, we, I've mentioned that earlier. So it's about activities that they take up and that um, are of benefit for others, or you work on your own body in order to be less of a burden to the health system in old age. Now, we can talk about an actual win-win strategy because everybody can benefit from that. So. In society, you have more resources when the elderly uh, are also participating and doing their share. And we could say, uh, and the elderly have something to do, if you will. So this could be a win-win situation. And you know, when they bake fresh apple pie, that is something that help benefits the whole for, the, for the entire family and uh, society. Now, as a sociologist, it is part of my job description to be skeptical when people say it's a win-win for all, because in a 
society which is characterized by imbalances of power and conflicts of interest, this is very rare. And let me just say <laughs> up forefront, I'm not against any activity and I'm not against health or competence. However, let me ask, what are the political and social frameworks, conditions that have um, allowed activity, productivity and competence to become a central question of age and aging? And who are the actors that propagate this win-win constellation? And who determines what the actual benefit consists of? What do we know about the opinions and wishes and desires and plans of the old people that are now called upon to become active? Now, following this um, uh, skeptical approach of my field, I would now like to look at four areas where we are currently talking about a renegotiation of aging. I will talk about autonomy, the new autonomy for healthy aging, the instrumentalization of activated aging as a social political resource, wrong promises when people say they valorize or revaluate aging, and active aging and social inequality. Healthy aging, so it seems to be suggested, is one of the main prerequisites of active aging in your work life and beyond. And for a long time, age um, seemed like a biological fate. We've heard about plasticity, but still, if you look at the history of things, we talked about or we heard about the woman with the highest life um, uh, of recent years, but life expectancy in the 1870s was 35.6 for men and 38.6 for women. Today, we all know men li male life expectancy is roughly 80 years and female is even more. But what this shows is the average life expectancy. Of course, it doesn't mean that people back then in the 1900s died at the age of 35 or 38. No, they lived longer than that. But it's a fascinating development and fascinating to observe how many people actually reach these limits of what is physically possible. Of course, you had a high rate of child mortality back then. You had other risks and problems that you will see in a linear form in research. So we have made some progress as a society and we have made some progress in adapting life expectancy to the circumstances, which is great. However, what is problematic is that responsibility is now shifted more and more to the individual, the responsibility for a healthy life and healthy aging. And this matches social political processes, environmental factors that influence aging, for example, uh, shift work, um, bad working conditions, poverty, noise. And it's more and more about the behavior of the individual being, your nutrition, your uh, physical exercise, etc. Insurance companies, for example, health insurance companies, they fund cookery courses or yoga classes for stress prevention. Uh, but they do not fund behavioral responses of employees against noise, dust or mobbing by their superiors, because even though they know that these are the biggest risk factors. With this, within this notion of this dovetailing of aging and and diseases, non-aging become seems to become a choice and seems to become individual commitment. So if you age, you might say you haven't worked enough on yourself. But I because if you lead a life without physical exercise, vitamins or rest, why would you age healthily and why would you have a long life expectancy? Well, just by looking at the sheer number of books on these topics, books that give you advice about aging, that speaks volumes. Uh, uh, there is even dog food, anti-aging dog food, which has led to numerous fights within families between parents and their children. So yes, there is a lot to be considered. But seriously, what is important to me to say is by shifting the responsibility to the individual, we sort of disregard the structural preconditions. We only demand something of the individual and 
leave out side the fact that um, the structures might need to be changed. Current changes in the world of work, in particular an increasing precariousness and insecurity and the compression of workflows add to a significantly increasing social inequality and poverty, and more and more people are subject to unhealthy conditions. If you work um, in shift work and with a lot of, n um, lot of noise around you, you can eat as much broccoli as you want. You will not age healthily because that will not change anything. Healthy aging is, of course, great. But to shift responsibility to the individual increases social pressure on those that do do not meet the norm, that are sick, ill, vulnerable, restricted, or that they need care. So praising the healthy, high-performance, fit young old people are contrasted by the other side of the coin, people who need care, who suffer from dementia. And you lose sight of the fact that the other side of the coin suffers from negative stereotyping. I'll come to the second point of my presentation, activation of age. It does not happen in a vacuum, but it is embedded in a comprehensive social political shift in paradigms in flexible capitalism. Let's talk about activation and let's talk about autonomy, your own responsibility. These are the new key categories of a new social policy. What we witness is a transition from the state that will take care of you to the responsibility of yourself to take care of you, from public to private responsibility, from collective to individual risk management. This is not the state retreating, but it's a change in the logic of the welfare state and, and the welfare state steering or controlling um, the uh, population. So you are the recipients of benefits and you are less the bearers of rights, but bearers of duties. Over the past decades, there were cuts and drastic changes in the security systems, underfunding, underfunded municipalities, restrictions of um, in public infrastructure, severe repercussions in urban areas, partial privatizations of post-employment benefits, cuts in pensions, insurance contributions for unemployment benefits, etc., etc. But problematic is this, is also this. It's not only this policy of cutbacks and privatizations, but it's also in there. Are, there's new demand that exists that comes to the surface because there's demographic change and gender political change, so new demands emerge. The gender ratio, the gender in our modern society creates some questions, some tension. We have a simultaneousness, simultaneousness of change and uh, insisting that things stay the same. More and more women earn an income now and are not available anymore as secret resources of social policy. And the pandemic showed this. There is still the domestic distribution of work that follows the old structures with women doing more than men. So there is a gap that was created, a gap in care for children and adolescents, but also the care of older relatives. And who will step in if the previous, you know, housewives that are now mostly earning an income, going to work, who will do it, who will care for family members. Just to mention it, there are also contrarian developments. In 1995, the care insurance was introduced. It was an anti-cyclical expansion of the social state. But right from the beginning, it was a partial coverage in, in so insurance, nothing more. So the gap will still increase and is not covered by state um, measures. But who would come in and who would help? Who would take over the role that housewives played in former times? And this is where the fit and healthy old people come into play that were previously sent into well-deserved retirement. Because the activation of age is much more than just prolonging 
the time you can go to work, you can earn an income. No, you even extend the phase where you can help. And how many people have realized during the pandemic what it means? What does it mean if you have your grandchildren nearby? Or what does it mean if they are not able to help you? How many soup kitchens had to close because the old people were not there to do voluntary service anymore? So old people as a social resource, we find that in several fields. Here is an example by Heribert Prantl in Süddeutsche Zeitung. Um, aging is something that we still need to learn. It will make society more human because the elderly have more time for the things that the young don't have time for. This long autumn of life will make society more social, where the years given will not only be leisure time, but also social time. So what we are witnessing is a society where people provide services and support, but in an unpaid way or just low paid voluntary work is one of the new pillars of the welfare state with all of the consequences and problems that this entails for the professionality of services or labor law standards. When you look at the field of care, it becomes especially obvious. There is this new law about the care and care business, um, strengthening the act on strengthening the care field. So voluntary help, vol voluntary um, volunteers who help in families that where one of the family members needs care is systematically funded and promoted. You get a reimbursement, but these reimbursements are clearly below the minimum wage. So, uh, and there's no protection in terms of labor law. So there is a problematic transition and um, a, a transition to the low-wage sector and care services become precarious. Against the background of these developments, it is short-sighted when politicians think and welcome the positive activation of age, but at the same time warn uh, of their bad instrumentalization in care and, and care businesses to compensate for a new lack of public services. And I thank you. I thank all of you, because without you, there wouldn't be a public debate about this. We would be a fringe uh, research area. And to connect to what Mr. Kluge said, it's not about the activity uh, of people, that people are active. It's not about enabling them to uh, tap their potential. What made aging and age become a popular issue is participation, is gaps in social infrastructure. This is a part of the law that I mentioned, which um, mentions the elderly and resources. It says, in times of tight public budgets, the promotion and strengthening of civil society is gaining in importance because the public sector will have to concentrate on its unavoidably necessary tasks due to the inevitable budget consolidation. It is therefore necessary to strengthen incentives for the willingness to engage in civic engagement. And furthermore, the Act uh, states that old people, elderly people, are I targeted with that. It brings me to the third part of my presentation, activation and re-evaluation of aging, of age. This w promise of a win-win situation is not only problematic because it simply assumes that the demands and desires of old people are the same, uh, are similar to the activities that they demand. They are not even asked what they want. What is also problematic is the popular argumentation that the activation of age of old people um, would be uh, contributing to the fight against um, uh, discrimination of old people. What, is, what people are promised are a new appreciation of age and old people. 
So the message could be, thank you for letting us use you as a resource. The anti-discrimination policy is still in its infancy in Germany, and I'm hoping that it will gain more importance. I think that is one of the major problems. This is a topic which in the Anglo-Saxon countries has a term, there's a term for it, ageism. In Germany, in German, doesn't even have, have a term. But also this promise to value age more is completely, completely falls by the wayside. First and foremost, the potential of old people uh, is of no interest because old people are perceived still as a problem. But it also shows an openly negative perception of old people and age if and when this growing share of old people in society is discussed in terms of overaging, in terms of being a burden, a load, it's measured with the age load quotient. This, so this idea of tapping into the potential of age, behind that, what looms behind that, is a really deeply negative image of age and aging. Aging seems like a danger. Society must be protected from it. We need to overcome discriminate, discriminating rules and pract pract practices. We need to create the prerequisites for an active participation in society. This idea that older people need to uh, perform in advance, to perform up up front and invest up front just to be recognized and appreciated. That is contrary to a an anti-discrimination policy. So if you promise appreciation as an effect or reward of being able to use old people as a resource, shows clearly it is not about appreciation or value of age and old people in all its shapes and forms. It shows that there is a clear discrepancy. People are still slow, sick and flexible when they're old and there are others that are active. So there are some stereotypes, the ones that I've just mentioned, which are negative. Sl people are slow, people are sick, but they are simply pushed upwards in people's lifespan. The highest age, the oldest age, where people na need care, that is still seen as a deficit if it receives attention at all. And at the same time, you could say that the young and the healthy elderly are quite performant and performant attributes, but at the same time, they remain the others. And I will talk about that with respect to the uh, COVID pandemic. So they are actually addressed as the same, but in a discourse analysis over several decades, they have been analyzed and you always have some characterization old and young need to work together. The young are creative, innovative and fast. The old are reliable, loyal and solid. So the elderly in this course are actually um, given a certain value. They are activatable parts of society. However, they are associated with skills that are the co complete opposite of what companies are looking for. And if you take a look at these attributes, which usually um, tend to, they, they are not as competitive, they are more humane, they are more social, then you realize that the positive other of the capitalistic performance society is something that you, you can't actually buy anything of that. You can't make a living of that. People, uh, especially women, know what I'm talking about. They used to be friendly and warm-hearted and um, very social and they don't earn as much. But So these attributes can also be seen more and more in young elderly because their characters are the new housewives really it's a provocation but they are the new housewives now let me talk about the fourth headline of the problematic so the social inequalities that we have heard of today already it's a fact that not all elderly uh, have the same resources, but 
the question of social inequality comes up when it comes to the aging society, generation, intergenerational. But nevertheless, it's not very prominent. In this discourse on active and productive age, now in policy, but also in the media, then you can see that this is the um, the, the middle class that we're talking about. So it couldn't be any more bourgeois. It's, it's former managers who volunteer in, ca in advising young managers who deal with province, the problems. They are professors who work on their biographies or grandparents um, who go to the children's opera with their grandchildren. It's a privileged minority with, they, they are quite wealthy and they become the threshold or the benchmark for other um, older generations who actually have less capital. So there is a certain pressure that they have to deal with and they cannot fulfill this standard. And very often we see that questions of social inequalities are not just topicalized, but they are actually also done away with. And if you talk about uh, the age, the old age, it's about homogenization. It's about ha have you people who are in average healthy, in average more wealthy, in average more healthy. But in Germany, we have the highest inequalities when it comes to wealth in, in the EU. With the, the, the it's, it's uh, far growing fast. We are living in a society where these people are. Div differ from this average. So they live at the fringes of, of existence and being able to make a living, although they are on average healthier. And this brings me to a thing, a fact that Andreas Kuse has also talked about, and it's correct to say that we have an increased lifespan a fastly increased lifespan. Nevertheless, here the average values are the highest scandal, the highest problem of social inequality. And they actually do away with that as well. Even in a wealthy country such as Germany and other European countries, you don't just differ, have differences between the lifestyles, but also the lifespan and also the healthy life that you refer to. Now, in everyday life, when you talk about lifespan, Everybody will say women will live longer than men. However, we have a class specific lifespan and life expectancy. We have great data on that um, from the institutes, but this is a, a social taboo, and I think it's one of the biggest failures, even in the pandemic, not to have used this situation in order to point out this existential uh, inequalities. Just to give you an example, when we talk about men, where the uh, differences are actually even bigger. Now, when you have someone with an income, which is less than 60% of the average, and compare them to those who have more than 150% of the average income, then the difference in lifespan, or life expectancy is 10.8 years. And this is a dimension of social inequality that is actually lost in, so in, in everyday life because it's always about switching and, and moving resources, but this existential dimension is neglected. And this brings me back to uh, the individualization of health responsibility. Of course, there are lifestyle factors that lead to that fact. We heard of that. It starts very early in life where you need to make a change in your lifestyle. And there's also an educational factor. But I like to point out there are certain factors such as um, opportunities for education, it's your work conditions. We need to have a prevention policy, not just to have cooking classes, but to really deal with the grassroots of social inequalities and difficult work conditions in order to decrease the discrepancy of life expectancy. And apart from that, just look at what it means for your um, retirement re uh, um, 
because when you have little resources, you pay for the retirement of those who have made a lot more money before. And I really don't understand how this system should work. When it comes to generational um, fairness or equalities, then usually it's suggested that the elderly live um, on uh, are a burden to the younger ones. But I always have always seen in my studies a homogenization, and I would say that the gap is not between old and young, but in other con other areas, uh, uh, poor and rich and other factors, and not young and old. Nevertheless, I would like to finally point out, before I talk about the pandemic and the current situation, as problematic as these four items here, that at first time they seem quite harmless, on uh, active and proactive age. It doesn't mean that there aren't maybe even some opportunities. Of course, it is part of our society and our rethought society that we have biomedical reasons and conditions that think, well, age is already determined by biology and you can't change it. But we should overcome that thinking and take a look at the social and societal opportunities that we could tap. So that means the activation discourse could still, it's despite its po problems and problematics, could still be an opportunity and lead to the fact that elder people do not have to live in a niche of their well-deserved retirement. You know, any, any autonomy and interdependency or, uh, or freedom could actually become a potential and maybe sometime they used to be active in society and then they will be called upon and maybe then they are not really de looking for participation because they will be able to benefit from high quality care. So these are opportunities that can also be seized. Now let's take a look at a very interesting but also shocking development, namely the question, how has the social view on age under the pandemic conditions, uh, you know the framework conditions, we all know about the higher risk in old age of um, attracting COVID-19. And I think it was a completely wrong decision to isolate uh, people in need of care and old people. And I don't want to go into detail here, but still I would like to point out that in the pandemic something happened. Because extremely fast, the, the, there was a higher risk. You, you know, let's take a look at the big differences between the age groups. And that led to the fact that all old people were a vulnerable group in society. And suddenly, all the young old who uh, were considered healthy, fit and, and proactive, suddenly, from one day to the other, they were part of a collective group they, that was talked about and not, to, not talked to. So they weren't participating any longer. The, and, and they were actually accused of being old and, and of high risk. And a journalist once talked about a totalitarianism of care because here it was a group who needed to be taking that needed to be taken care of and very often and we had a look at that in the media you could see in the reports in the media when it was about older people who were not in need of care or not in nursing homes that there was this tendency that for the young people it was very tough because they couldn't go outside they couldn't socialize but you know the elder well the elderly are always at home, aren't they? And they have a very timid life and they don't socialize as much. But actually, when it, it would be interesting to take a look at this in a more systematic way, but the pandemic led to the fact that certain stereotypes that we thought were, had been forgotten for a long time now 
came up again that that the elderly are quite uh, domestic and calm and then there was a journalist who said well the the fund society uh, that has always excluded the old and the elderly uh, can now be legitimized but what dominated in the pandemic and that brings me back to my title of what do the elderly owe us who's us and who are the elderly and why do we always ask questions from the perspective of us or we that would actually mean that we don't feel old so this this polarization is strongly connected to an, a victim and rescuer narrative we protect the elderly and vice versa we protect them so what do they owe us now they they still went outside they wanted to see their grandchildren can you imagine now there was this this narrative of victims and rescuers so how they behaved even though we protected them they have to they have to oblige now and we could also see that luckily due to the vaccinations we never came to that point in time that with a longer time period how long will we be able to afford this to protect the elderly so that means this situation we do it however we will get to an end and then it will be harmful to the economy and to our children so by this polarization in our discussions we didn't really talk about how do we protect all of us and the mainly vulnerable groups but not just the elderly to polarize it if we talked about if if there were old people in old age if they were given the a voice because suddenly they were an object of administration and care but when they did have the opportunity opportunity to talk then it were privileged people and i've got two different sources of bild zeitung and tuts and i gave you an example here 28 um prominent people or uh, of the there who are older than 70 said well we want to stay home so the young people have a future and the economy won't collapse similar of uh, to um an, an appeal to older people uh, lock us in because we cannot harm humanity uh, by, uh, by short time work or losing their jobs because we are the old people, the, we are the, uh, the richest retired people ever in Germany. The elder people who have the opportunity to go on luxury cruises, we represent the rich generation and we are a burden to the younger generation the poor old people and they didn't well they were not included or older people who are not able to afford cruises they were not um, included here either but it was quite polit political to have these quotes and sometimes there were elder generations who did not have the means and who are not as wealthy as those who were reflected here so that means when we talk about age and aging then we can talk about we, we must talk about social inequalities as well and once we talk about we and they this usually does not just mean that we use them in a passive voice and make others passive but this also negate negates extreme social inequalities within the generations so the problem is and this is has been become obvious in the pandemic and it shows the debate and the political steering on active and productive age it doesn't solve the problem the problem is solved when the old ones are the others and remain the others. So I need to activate them. Or sometimes you get answers to the instrumentalized activation and production discourse. So those who have re-biologized age, we have to protect them. They need to relax. They need to calm down. They deserve it after a long career. That is not the answer. The answer is 
to enable them. The answer is to enable them and to give them conditions f and p opportunities for health and active life, for a fulfilled life. The answer is a consequent anti-discrimination of old age, of old age who should not owe for uh, being taken care of. So this brings me to the beginning. It's not about against health, against activity, against competencies, but against the instrumentalization of the old generation and, uh, and using them as a tool in society. Thank you very much. For standing ovations for These are almost standing ovations, Mrs. Van Dyke. Thank you very much for this presentation, which was highly fascinating and gave us a lot of food for thought. Immediately what comes to mind is this populism where you construct a we and they. That is what um, was evoked by your words, a we and a they, which interests uh, clash. I'm sure we will talk about that during the coffee break, which will now ensue. Thank you, Mr. Iwama, for having stayed here and listened to the presentations until now. Apparently, the topic was interesting enough to capture his attention. Thank you very much. Have a nice rest of the evening with the ensuing meetings. And to all of you, enjoy the break. And at a quarter to five, we will come back to meet again for the second part of this symposium. Caloric restriction. Keep that in mind during the break when you enjoy the food and catering. Thank you very much.